This video is meant to be an introduction to the basic notion of continuity. Besides continuity, however, there's going to be a common thread to this presentation, and that is how do you use tools that you've been using before to build new tools that you can use in the future? For example, we know the identity law holds for limits, as well as the product law. So suppose n is a natural number, in other words, a positive integer, 1, 2, 3, or so on. What is the limit as x approaches a of x to the n? First, we simply observe that x to the n is simply the product of x with itself n times. That means we can apply the product law for limits that many times. Each of these limits can be evaluated using the identity law. The result is that the limit of x to the n is simply a to the n. The punchline is that we have a new law, we could call it the power law, which tells us how to evaluate x to the n when n is a natural number. This law is really a simple combination of the identity law and the product law working together. So now it's time to learn about continuity. Suppose we have a function f and the limiting value as x approaches a of f of x is l. Suppose further that the function value at a happens to be l as well. In other words, the limiting value as x approaches a of f of x matches the value of f at a. When this happens, we say f is continuous at the argument a, or simply f is continuous at a, or if we want to emphasize the fact that a is one of the possible inputs x we could use, we might say f is continuous at x equals a. When a function is continuous at an argument a, one of the consequences is that the graph right at the argument a is unbroken, so to speak. The limiting value and the value match. Another way to think about it is the limiting value existing tells you that there's some trend that the function is building up to, and the fact that the value there is equal to the limiting value sort of completes that trend. The definition of continuity is quite important. It's something you should know. You should also notice that continuity is defined at a particular argument. So let's show that a polynomial function is continuous at every possible argument. So first, pick your favorite polynomial function. We don't know exactly what that'll look like, so we'll have to give a general formula for it using coefficients c0, c1, etc. And it's degree n. We don't know what the degree is, but it shouldn't matter. We're going to be able to prove this for any possible polynomial. Similarly, you should be able to pick any argument you want. It's like a magic trick. Pick a, any a. We don't want to commit ourselves, so we're just going to use the symbol a to denote some real number. Our job is to show that the function p is continuous at a, so we're going to have to examine the limit as x approaches a of p of x. First, we'll substitute in our formula for p. We'll notice that we have a sum of several functions so we can apply the sum rule several times. Now each of those functions has a scalar in front of it so we can apply the scalar law as well. The last term, however, is simply a constant function so we can evaluate its limit already. You should notice that what's left is a bunch of power functions and we just got done building a new tool to deal with those so the limiting value of each of those is the appropriate power of a. Now we're quite close to being done all we need to do is recognize what we have. And what we have is exactly the expression you would get if you substitute a for x in your formula for p. So in the end, what we've proved is that the limiting value of p as x approaches a matches up with the value p of a. And so p is, by definition, continuous at a. This is a very powerful fact. A polynomial function is continuous at every argument on the number line. By the way, instead of saying every argument on the number line, we could just say a polynomial function is continuous on R. That's our shorthand way of saying 
a polynomial function is continuous at any argument, no matter which argument you pick on the real number line. No matter what kind of polynomial you graph, second, third, fourth degree polynomial, it doesn't matter, you'll notice that the graph of a polynomial is unbroken everywhere. That's just horrible English, however, we might better say it's not broken anywhere. And many of those, as it turns out, there are many other functions that are continuous at every argument in the number line. Sine, cosine, and e to the x are such functions. It would be hard to prove continuity at the moment. As it turns out, if we just wait for a little while, we're going to have much more powerful proofs that these functions are continuous. For now, we'll just take it as a fact that they're certified continuous, and we'll use that fact in the near future. Let's look at the absolute value function and ask the question, is this continuous at every argument on the real number line? Let's try to answer the question using our mathematical definitions. In other words, we're going to try to show that for any argument a, the limiting value of the absolute value of x as x approaches a is actually equal to the absolute value of a. We'll try not to appeal to any of our heuristic ways of thinking about things. For example, you might look at the origin and you might say, gee, is this spot broken? Because if this counts as broken, then the function's not continuous at the origin. That's not the way you want to try to answer such questions. You need to appeal to the mathematical definitions. It's going to be important to remember how the absolute value can be defined. It's a piecewise formula. Absolute value of x is equal to negative x if x is less than 0, and it's just x if x is greater than or equal to 0. Why does this formula work? Well, just think of it this way. If you plug in a number that's already positive, absolute value doesn't do anything to it. If you plug in a number that's negative, you got to switch the signs to make sure it's positive. We'd like to play the same kind of trick as we did before for polynomials. In other words, we'd like to say pick a, any a. And we're going to do that, but we're going to break the argument into three cases. First case is we'll choose a positive argument. We're going to zoom in near that argument and imagine what the absolute value graph looks like near there. Since absolute value of x is equal to x for all positive x, turns out that the graph of absolute value simply looks like a polynomial. In other words, near the argument a, the absolute value function is literally a polynomial function. And we already know that a polynomial function is continuous at every argument on the real number line. So the absolute value function is continuous at that argument. This takes care of the case when your argument is positive. And now we're going to choose an argument that's negative. Once again, we'll zoom in near that argument. And the key observation here is, once again, near the argument, the absolute value function is simply polynomial. Very simple polynomial, it looks like negative x. So once again, near the argument a, the absolute value function is literally polynomial and therefore is automatically continuous. So we've taken care of negative arguments. That leaves only one argument, zero. We need to take zero on as a special case. And notice this is the case that really concerned us to begin with. Does this count as broken? So let's take a look at the limit and we'll break this limit up into two cases coming from the left and the right. From the left, we're going to substitute the appropriate formula in since all of our x are negative, the formula for absolute value is negative x. Therefore, we're looking at this limit, which is pretty obviously zero. Similarly, from the right side, absolute value of x is always equal to x, and therefore the limit from the right is also zero. So the limit from the left is zero and the limit from the right is zero, which means that the flat out limit as x approaches zero is zero. We'll point out something that's a little silly, but the absolute value of zero is equal to zero. Why do we want to point that out? Because this allows us to recognize that the limit as x approaches zero of absolute value of x is the absolute value of zero. Here's what the continuity of f at a would be written as. And you'll notice 
that what we came up with above is precisely the template to show that the absolute value function is continuous at the argument zero. So where does that put us? No matter what kind of argument we plug in, positive, negative, or zero, the absolute value function is continuous at that argument. In other words, the absolute value function is continuous on R. So we're going to take a detour here and ask a question which seems almost silly on the face of it. What's the difference between f and f of x? And the short answer is f is the name of a function and f of x is the value of that function at the argument x. So it may be silly to worry about such matters, but it turns out that confusion about these kinds of things is often the source of confusion generally. If you find out that you're just confused about the way we're talking about something, then it makes sense to sort that out so that you're not confused. f is the name of a function. A function's a complicated gadget. It does things to numbers to give you other numbers. So when we refer to a function, we're talking about that gadget. When we refer to f of x, we're really talking about a number that comes out of that function. In other words, a function value. So how might you use these in different contexts? For every statement about the function f, there's usually a closely related statement about the value f of x. For instance, if you say the domain of f is r, what you're saying really is that f of x is defined for all real x. If you say f is an even function, you're really saying f of negative x is equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f. And if you say f is continuous at a, you're really saying the limiting value of f of x as x approaches a is equal to f of a. Try to keep straight the distinction between a function f and the value of that function f of x at a particular argument x. Turns out to be pretty hard to be strict about keeping these distinctions, and there's good reason for that. Some functions have perfectly nice names like sine, cosine, and the natural logarithm. Their values would be sine x, cosine x, and the natural logarithm of x. But what about the values of the functions here, e to the x and x squared? If we just stripped away the x, we'd be left with an e or a floating 2, and these are just disastrous as the names of functions. Now, some people try to give the exponential function a special name exp. You might see that in which case exp of x is the same as e to the x, but it's not that popular, and no one's really come up with a good name for the squaring function. So why are we making such a big deal about names of functions as opposed to values? Well, we're about to embark on a little discussion where keeping that distinction is pretty important. So for the next few slides, at least, let's really try to keep track of names of functions and function values. Suppose f and g are functions and k is a real number. We can define various new functions from these ingredients. We can define the scalar multiple of f by k, the sum of f and g, the product of f and g, and the quotient of f and g. How do we find values of these functions? Well, we need to define them, and we do it in a rather obvious way. What is kf of x? We define it to be k times the value of f at x. Similarly, the sum function evaluated at x is exactly what you get if you just add the function values for f and g. The product and the quotient are defined similarly. So now we claim that if f and g are continuous at an argument a, then so are the functions kf, f plus g, and f times g. The punchline here is going to be that when you have continuous functions, you can make obvious combinations of them and be guaranteed that your new functions are also continuous. So this is an important theorem that we're going to carefully prove. And first we'll take care of the sum function. What is the limiting value of f plus g as x approaches a? The value of f plus g is just what you get when you add the values of f and g independently we have a limit law for sums. It allows us to break this apart into the sum of two limits. F's continuous, so the limit on the left is f of a, 
g is also continuous, so now we know that this result is f of a plus g of a, which is simply the definition of f plus g evaluated at a. Punchline, these two things are equal, and we conclude that the sum function f plus g is continuous at a. Let's move to the product function f times g. It's essentially the same proof. You use your definition of f times g to look at the limit. You apply the appropriate product law for limits. You notice that f and g are both continuous, and you recognize your definition of f times g, and you've just proved that the limiting value of f times g evaluated at x as x approaches a is the value of f times g at a. In other words, f times g is continuous at a. And finally, for the function kf, a very similar proof applies. If you work out the definitions, apply the appropriate limit laws, you'll find out that this function is continuous at a as well. So here's a function. It's a big combination of other simpler functions, and the question is, is f continuous on r? So let's piece together how this is built from more basic functions. Sine is continuous on r, and therefore 3 sine x is also a continuous function. e to the x is a continuous function, and so we can take the sum, and it's also continuous. A polynomial function is continuous, and finally, we can take the product of these two continuous functions, and we're guaranteed of another continuous function. Now, e to the x, sine x, and polynomials are continuous at every argument, and so this combination is also continuous at every argument. In other words, f is continuous on r. Now, this looks like a ferocious problem. Let's try to evaluate the limit of f of x as x approaches pi over 4 from the right. Even though it looks hideous, we should not panic. We have all the tools we need to take this problem apart. We just need to do it one step at a time. First, we'll exploit the fact that f is continuous at every argument on the real line. In particular, it's got to be continuous at pi over 4. And that means the limiting value as x approaches pi over 4 has to equal f of pi over 4. Now, the limiting value has to be the same from the left or the right, so it's a little bit of a distraction to worry about the limit from the right. We know how to evaluate the limit flat out, so the limit from the right is going to be the same value. We can carefully substitute pi over 4 into the formula for f and come up with this expression, which then has to match the limiting value of f of x as x approaches pi over 4 from the right. So you might have noticed that one combination was missing from our theorem about continuity. We've seen that quotients are tricky in terms of limits, so it shouldn't come as a shock that continuity of quotients is a little bit tricky as well. We're just going to have to be a little bit careful. So the theorem states that, in fact, the quotient of continuous functions is again continuous as long as you haven't chosen an argument where the denominator function is zero. So we're going to try to imitate the proofs we did for the sum and the product, but we're going to be very cautious about what could happen in the denominator. Here we've applied the definition of a quotient of functions. Now we'd like to use the quotient law for limits, but we know that we can't do this unless we can be guaranteed that the denominator function is non-zero. Let's hold on to that thought for a second f and g are both continuous at a, so we know the limits of the numerator and denominator functions individually are f of a and g of a. Now we realize that we demanded g of a not be zero for this theorem to work. That means this denominator value g of a is non-zero, but of course that matches the limiting value from the previous line. So that limiting value wasn't zero, and the quotient law was okay to use. Now we simply recognize that in the end we have the value of the quotient function at a. That's what we need to show that the quotient of f and g is continuous at a.
So let's give this new theorem a test drive. Here's a function g. It has the formula g of x equals cosine squared x over e to the x plus 1. Is this function continuous on the whole real number line? So we'll take this apart into its pieces just like we did with the product earlier. Cosine x is continuous on r. And we'll notice that cosine squared is just the product of cosine with itself. And so that product is also continuous on r e to the x is continuous on r, and the constant function 1, being a polynomial, is also continuous on r, so its sum is continuous on r. And now we make an important observation. e to the x is always positive. That guarantees that e to the x plus 1 can never be negative. And since we're trying to show g of x is continuous at every possible argument, it's important to notice that e to the x plus 1 is never 0, and that doesn't matter what x you use. e to the x plus 1 is not equal to 0 for all real x. That means that the quotient is going to be continuous for every argument x. And we've proved that this quotient function is in fact continuous on r. Now let's end with a few thoughts about rational functions. Recall that a rational function is precisely a quotient of polynomials. So here's an example of a rational function that's the quotient of two linear functions. Here's a rather ferocious looking rational function, which is the quotient of a fifth degree polynomial by a 51st degree polynomial. This might surprise you. This function is in fact a rational function because we can express it as the ratio of x squared over 1, 1 being a polynomial function, that makes x squared a rational function. And finally, here's a very simple rational function, 1 over x. To obtain the domain of a rational function, you take all the real numbers and you throw out all the arguments which make the denominator function 0. For example, here's a rational function whose domain is a set of all real numbers except negative 2 and 2 because they are the arguments that would make x squared minus 4 equal 0. The rational function 1 over x has domain all reals except 0 and because x squared plus 5 is always positive, the function 10x over x squared plus 5 has domain all real numbers. There are no arguments that make the denominator 0. We've already proved a theorem about quotients of continuous functions, and we can simply apply it in this case. We can assert that a rational function is continuous at every argument in its domain. After all, the numerator and the denominator functions are both polynomials, which are therefore continuous at every real number. The quotient of continuous functions is continuous at every argument a for which q of a is not equal to 0. But that's saying precisely for all the a that are in the domain of f. So let's revisit those three examples we saw. In all three cases, the graph is relatively unbroken. In fact, the only breaks that occur in the graph are precisely at the arguments that are missing from the domain. And of course, in the third case, there are no breaks at all, because in that case, the function is continuous on R. These spots with breaks in the graph are called discontinuities. But that's the topic of another video.